I had interviewed a lot of women over the years who had gone through breast cancer, had no idea what they had gone through, you know, from the outside. And then when it happened to me, obviously, when it happens to you, you understand a lot more. And I was quite frustrated, which led to the shower shirt. You know, women have been going through mastectomies in this country for 70 years and basically showering in plastic trash bags to protect surgical drain sites. So anything we can do to raise awareness on the product so women understand they don't have to be reduced to trash bags after a breast amputation. Welcome to the Invention Stories podcast, where we share stories of inventors who turn their idea into a product. Please visit our website at www.inventionstories.com. And now, from the Invention Stories Podcast World Headquarters Studios in Morro Bay, California, is our host, Robert Baer. Welcome to the Invention Stories Podcast. I am your host, Robert Baer, and thank you for joining us. You're listening to Episode 17 of the Invention Stories Podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the Shower Shirt. This episode is the first in a two-part series. We've got Lisa Kreitz on the line, so let's begin. Welcome, Lisa, to the Invention Stories podcast. I want to jump right in and ask you, uh, what kind of child were you? Did you like figuring out how things worked, or were you a tomboy? Were you, what kind of girl were you? You know, um, I was the epitome of a Midwest farmer's daughter. I am a Midwest farmer's daughter. grew up in southeast Missouri. I had three brothers. So, yeah, I pretty much had to, to fend for myself. It's like my mom and I were the estrogen side. There was a lot of testosterone in the house. So I was very much a tomboy, and it taught me in dealing with three very strong, uh, you know, brothers. It it taught me to be strong. Yeah, I I had a great childhood, but in looking back, it was amazing how much of a tomboy I was because I had to keep up with my brothers. Did you have any family members who were inventors? I did not. When you asked earlier, if I was when I was young, did I like to figure things out? I never did. I have to say when I was young, all I loved to do was read about about social medical news. And my parents always wanted me to become clinical because I loved health and medical stories. And I always said, no, I don't want to become clinical. I just want to cover everyone's health and medical stories, which is why I ended up in broadcast journalism from a health and medical side. I have to say, no, there were no inventors in my family. And I always kind of call myself the accidental inventor. I uh, basically became aware of a huge need for women after breast cancer, and I felt that it was my responsibility to create a product to help future breast cancer patients better get through post-mastectomy care than I did. Now, Lisa, when you were in high school, you were pretty focused that you knew what you wanted to be. You wanted to be a broadcast journalist. Yes. When I was in high school, like I said, that was really my reading, where my friends were watching soap operas and reading Harlequins, which is crazy in high school. I always read health and medical news. So when I went to college in Kentucky, I went to school at Western Kentucky, Murray State University. I ended up with a Fulbright scholarship in music. I was classically trained. I was a classically trained pianist. So my first year uh, was to make my parents happy and use that four-year scholarship in music and piano. But after you know a year, I left the third floor journalism building and went up to the sixth floor, which was journalism. So uh, I left music quickly after a year and then, and then started studying journalism, yes. Did you get a job right out of college? Or did you start working in college for a newspaper? Or? I did. Actually, I did my First internship was after my freshman year in college, and I worked at a radio station, a country radio station. I had to be there at 5 a.m., and I read the news. Again, we're talking a small town. The town was about 8,000 people, small country radio station, and read the news at the top and bottom of the hour from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m., and then I did my real job because I didn't get paid for my radio internship. Uh, Then I lifeguarded the rest of the summer. So that was my first internship into the business, per se. And then my first semester, my junior year in college, I was able to attain a real internship. I worked for a bureau, which was the ABC affiliate in Illinois, in Southern Illinois. And so I did that uh, internship. Same scenario, you know, it was part time, but I got paid for it, which was great. And I wrote the local happenings. So I did that for one full semester, and then I went back to Kentucky to finish my junior year in college and then my senior year 
But to answer your question, no, when I first got out of college, I taught aerobics on a cruise ship, uh, the Big Red Boat, which was at the time the Disney Cruise Line. And my parents were very much, what are you doing? You have a journalism degree. You have two pretty good internships. What are you doing? And I think when I got out of college, like most kids that are 22 years old, they're like, oh, sick of school. I'm sick of being serious. I know college isn't serious for everyone. And I taught aerobics on a cruise ship for six months. And then I ended up, I call it my journalism hiatus. And then I got back into journalism. And so I ended up in Orlando, uh, Orlando TV market, where I worked for Channel 6, Channel 13, and America's Health Network out at Universal Studios. So I was, I was very fortunate in, quote, the broadcast business. But at the time, because I really wanted to focus on the health and medical niche, there weren't a lot of reporters that wanted to do health and medical. Most really loved fires, crimes, and murders. Uh, and that's what, you know, news is these days. You look at national news, that's what you get. And then the infighting between the left and the right. So at that time, really focusing on health and medical news, I, I absolutely loved it. And I was in the newsroom for about 12 years. Okay. Uh, you know what? I, actually, that sounds really awesome to go on a boat for six months after college. <laughs> uh, no, it, so, uh, it sounds perfect. Then you, you kind of don't feel like you're missing out, like jumping right in and being all serious with your life. You know what was fascinating about it? And it goes back to we're a product of our upbringing. We're a product of our experiences. And my experience was growing up in the Midwest, you know, on a farm in a very sheltered environment. And what I remembered so vividly, I walked on the cruise ship and all of a sudden I'm working with colleagues, per se, from 500 different countries. And that was fascinating to me. I was one of only three Americans on the cruise ship. Cruise ship companies, not to go into a lot of the business side, but the majority of people they employ on the cruise ships are from different countries. And so they come on board, you know, which is a great opportunity for them. They stop at all these different ports. And if you're American, you can't just jump off the ship if you don't. I mean, if you're American, you can jump off the ship if you don't like your job, but most people cannot. So that's what I found was just fascinating that all these people from so many different countries were there ultimately to send money back to their families. And it was one of the biggest life-changing experiences for me. And that was really fun, teaching aerobics on a cruise ship. So it was fun, but it was also amazingly educational for me. I can see that. So where are you at now? What city? Are you in Orlando? I'm actually in Cocoa Beach. Um, I'm just about 45 minutes from Orlando. I lived in Orlando for 20 years when I worked in news. And then I evolved out of news into the media strategy world. And that brought me beachside to the Cocoa Beach area. So I'm literally just down the street from Port Canaveral, which is a big cruise terminal. I'm just down the street from Kennedy Space Center. And we're in Touristville over here on the beach. But I love Brevard County in Cocoa Beach. Nice. All right. Uh, well, um, let's get right to it. What is the shower shirt? You know, it's funny when I'm at conferences and people that aren't familiar with the shirt, I hear the same question. Why would someone need a shirt in the shower? You know, and of course, after a while, you want to strangle those people. No, just kidding. The shower shirt, essentially. I went through breast cancer in 2009 and had a bilateral mastectomy. And unless you've gone through this clinical protocol, you don't realize uh, the processes. Essentially, after surgery, you have a couple drains sutured into your armpits or torso region, and it's basically to pull the fluid out of your body after surgery. And you can't shower with these drains. Essentially, the reasoning is behind this. Everything that comes out of the tap water is not sterile. That's why we drink filtered water every day. And so they don't want you in the, in the shower with the tap water. There's pathogens, bacteria, all kinds of things in the tap water. It can increase your chances of infection. So long story short, women with breast cancer who had mastectomy surgery and they have these drains, they can't shower for two to three weeks or until the drains are pulled by the physician. And the doctor told me I couldn't shower. I said, well, how, what am I supposed to do? And he says, you could jump in the shower with a trash bag if you like. Well, I did. The trash bag didn't work well. Being a past health and medical reporter, I immediately started asking questions to a lot of different physicians. Why is there not a product to protect me? Why isn't there a garment? And they all said, because no one's created one. So in my mind, I thought I could create a product for people that need it like me and future breast cancer patients. So we created uh, a water-resistant garment called the shower shirt. 
essentially it's exactly what it sounds. It's a shirt with elastic perimeters, uh, water resistant parachute material. It's got internal pockets to host the weight of the drains. And the best aspect of this, it's used for so many patient populations. Yes, the inception was breast cancer patients. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I wanted to help future breast cancer patients. However, in dealing with so many physicians and general surgeons, they introduced me to so many other patient populations that can use it, like patients with dialysis who have uh, drains, ports, or catheters in their body, uh, wound vac patients. There's just a myriad of patients that are now using the shower shirt. But of course, the inception was for breast cancer patients, and that's what's really is close to my heart are those breast cancer patients. You know, I was going to ask you that because I was wondering about like open heart surgery or something. I mean, uh, why wouldn't, I didn't know. So I'm glad that you <laughs> shared that because I was wondering if it would be for other areas. And now it's time for a commercial break. You're listening to episode 17 of the Invention Stories podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the Shower Shirt, part one. More information can be found at her website at www. Dot the shower shirt dot com. At the end of each episode, I invite listeners to email us with questions or comments about the show. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about podcasting as well. You can email us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Now, the question we've been asked most often is what kind of microphone should a beginning podcaster use? Now, the one that I've listened to, and it seems like most of the top podcasters use, is the Heil PR40. It's terrific. And if you're someone who wants to do something and do it right, the Heil PR40 is the microphone for you. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. Now, we use the Audio Technica ATR2100 here at the Invention Stories podcast, and it costs less than $80. To purchase the Audio Technica ATR2100, please visit www.inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. Is there any competition on the market currently? There's not. In fact, we're very lucky. We uh, had uh, initially applied for our patent in 2010, went on the market in 2011. And we, after, I guess, about a year, we were notified uh, that we were approved for our patent. And it is not only for design of the shower shirt, but method of use, which is what a lot of patent attorneys consider the gold standard. So we have the intellectual properties on it. So no. Not to say someone can't come along and create something comparable, but no, there is no other water-resistant garment on the market to protect chest surgery patients while showering. So we're very lucky. I can add to that one of our um, difficulties is we've been fighting for Medicare coverage, and we still don't have Medicare coverage. Of course, we sell shower shirts thousands every year to patients in need. But the legislative component of getting the Medicare coverage would really help out the product because anyone needing it would then be reimbursed by Medicare and then, of course, commercial insurance. So that is one struggle that we have in terms of the product. Most likely, once we get Medicare coverage, there'll be all kinds of shower shirt knockoffs out there. But right now, we are the only shower shirt and the original shower shirt. I still look around and think, why didn't this product you know, exist 10 years ago? And I guess just someone didn't have, have the foresight or maybe the, the gumption to create something and bring it to market. 10 years ago? How about 50 years ago? Yeah, well that, yeah, exactly. As I said, women have been going through mastectomies in this country for 70 years. Now, I'm not exactly sure of all the clinical protocol in terms of the drains and different things. But one huge issue, not to get too clinical on you, but one huge issue with breast cancer patients after mastectomy surgery, oftentimes you have uh, lymphedema patients and they where their arms are, are really swollen in different parts of their body. And it's because the fluid was not correctly drained out after surgery. I mean, lymphedema can be caused by many things. But this is one reason these drains that I was talking about are so important. They help pull that fluid out of the body. Of course, you have an increased infection rate in having them in and one being, you know, problem showering. But that's a very important part of post-mastectomy care are those drains so you don't get lymphedema and then, of course, protecting them from um, bacteria and pathogens. Because we say this very carefully with the shower shirt. It helps decrease the chances of a waterborne illness after mastectomy surgery. 
Good to know. You know, and I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get too personal or anything because, I mean, it would be like a real horrifying thing. Did you know that you had something wrong when you went to go to see the doctor? Were you sort of mentally prepared for him to, or her to get the diagnosis or, I mean, did it come out of left field or? Yes and no. I think genetically, biologically, uh, I had no family history of breast cancer. So Basically, all on paper, genetically and biologically, there's no reason that I would get breast cancer because I had no family history. But we all know there are people out there, it happens all the time, that end up with breast cancer with no family history. I have to tell you, I always felt from the time, here we go back to when I was a little girl, I always felt that I would get breast cancer. I don't know why, except maybe my mother went through surgeries here and there when I was in college. She had some cysts in her breast, but there was never any breast cancer. I always felt that I would get breast cancer, and that's really getting a little bit deep. There's a few other things I always felt would happen to me, and that did. So when I was diagnosed, I was like, okay, it's my turn, and now I know how how it feels. It was very personal to me because I had interviewed as a television reporter so many women who had gone through breast cancer, and you sit on the sidelines, and you hear their story, and you watch what they go through. And so you can empathize to a certain extent, just like any situation. But once it happens to you, no, I don't believe anyone is ever, ever prepared to hear those words you have breast cancer. Well, you you sort of explaining to me kind of like you're taking it in stride. If I was told that I had any form of cancer whatsoever, I I get a feeling I'm going to go to a really dark place, you know, for <laughs> for a long time. And you just sort of said, okay, this is it. I'm I'm ready to to attack it. Or what can I do? I mean, it just you know, uh, and, and again, I don't mind personal stuff. I have to say I had been in a dark place before because um, two things, because we're talking about it and we can get off the subject quickly, whatever you want, because you can ask whatever you want. Two things I always knew in my life was that I would have breast cancer. My mother would die tragically. And my mother did die, die tragically in a car accident in 2001. And then in 2009, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I had been in that dark place before. And I'm not so sure you ever totally get over that dark place of a loss of a parent or a mother from a female perspective. I've been in the dark place. So when I was diagnosed, so many of my friends and family members, they were like, Lisa, you're dealing with this so well. And I was like, oh, this is not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. So and I was, how do I say, knowledgeable enough. Sure. Cancer, that word, uh, that letter, the big C, the cancer scares people and it and it it absolutely you know changes your thought process but i also knew uh, my breast cancer was stage 1 it was not an aggressive form of breast cancer so i knew that it wasn't a life sentence i knew that we needed to be aggressive and you know i had two options one was chemo based radiation with um, which meaning I would go through chemotherapy and radiation with uh, medication for five years, tamoxifen, or the oncologist said if I chose to have a bilateral mastectomy that I would not have to do radiation or chemo and I wouldn't have to take medication. So going back to growing up with three brothers, being a very aggressive, stubborn individual, I knew that I had to take the aggressive approach and do whatever I could to not have breast cancer come back. So the bigger chance of not having it come back was the bilateral mastectomy. One quick nuance to that, when the pathology report came back, there was already breast cancer in the left breast. So I had it in both breasts, but I didn't know that because they had only found it in one. So without saying I had a crystal ball and knew what would happen in the future, once I had that mastectomy and the pathology report came back on both breasts, I would have had breast cancer again. So... At this point in my life, I'm just thrilled I made the choices I did. I feel so lucky, number one, to have been diagnosed and know that I had the disease. So many people out there, they don't know until it's stage three, stage four, and they're, you know, it's metastasized to other areas. So I was very lucky that they found it. I was very lucky I made the correct choices in going ahead and removing both breasts. And I feel blessed beyond belief to have been able to bring the product, the, the shower shirt to market to help other you know, breast cancer patients. And just like this scenario, I wouldn't be talking to you on your podcast, but for the shower shirt. So 
I'm blessed beyond belief that all this happened. And I do have a positive outcome where unfortunately, a lot of women do not. Did you just go to your doctors a, a regular course of things or did you, um, were you going because you were feeling kind of weird or? No, I felt fine. What had happened, and we teach this, you know, as journalists, <laughs> as, you know, OBGYNs and everybody teach for women to do self exams. Hmm. And I always said, what is it supposed to feel like? I don't know. And I remember my doctor said, Lisa, you'll know if it feels different. So I had been doing self exams and there was some kind of a knot there. So I went to my OBGYN and I said, can you feel that? I actually asked my husband at the time, I said, can you feel this? And he said, yes. So I knew it wasn't my imagination. Went to the doctor, can you feel this? Yes, I can. So they immediately took me in to have a mammogram and the radiologist quickly said, I'm not worried about that knot, it's a cyst, but I'm concerned about what's under it. So that's when they did a biopsy and it was in fact cancer. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, and that's another thing, you know, knowledge is power for women listening, whether you have a family history or not, do those self exams, be consistent with those self exams because the clinicians are correct. You may not know what you're looking for, or what you're feeling for, but if your breasts change, you will know it. And that's what happened to me. You've been listening to episode 17 of the Invention Stories podcast, Lisa Kreitz and the Shower Shirt Part 1. I want to thank Lisa for being our guest today. For more information, please visit her website at www.theshowershirt.com. If you're an inventor who would like to be featured on the Invention Stories podcast, have a suggestion on how we can make this podcast better, or would like to become a sponsor, please contact us at inventionstoriespodcast at gmail.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we invite you to write a positive review for us on iTunes. An easy way to get there is to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash review. More information and show notes can be found at our website, www.inventionstories.com. If you would like to purchase the Heil PR40, we invite you to go to www.inventionstories.com forward slash PR40. To purchase the Audio Technica ATR2100, please visit www.inventionstories.com forward slash ATR. Thank you very much for listening today, and please tell a friend.